Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Grolier Poetry Bookshop. I want to welcome you all to the reading tonight. Um, we ask that you all wear a mask for the entirety of the uh, reading, and if you could please silence your cell phones. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Adam Judah Krasnoff, who will be giving the introductions to it. Let's give him a warm welcome. in Boston with pebbled loafers. They complain, explain, try to capitalize not very well, having the time of their own lives in their real places, on their own ancient red bricks, in their own deep nothing. <clears throat> this is the first part of a, a long sequence of uh, satires, Florida. This is the first page. Crystal balls. If my 17-year-old so old self saw me, he would say, Whoa, Jackie Gleason, nice watch. <laughs> <laughs> this one's coming out in Spoke, too. I love Spoke. It's published by uh, Kevin Gallagher. It comes out every year, and it's a huge compendium of all interesting stuff happening in Boston, and often with the kind of the literary history of Boston. I think he, you know, like, for instance, there was a, great issue that was a tribute to Fanny. Mm. Lines for Dolly Parton, Emmy Lou Harris, and Linda Ronstadt, Trio, 1987. We need each of them for their specific and more often contending versions of reality which may never really be together again, now, before, never ending. And that is what we hear. We are that way. Harmony. Mm. That's a beautiful album, Trio. If you've never heard of it, I got a copy of it for a dollar at Burnfield on vinyl. It's a beautiful album to listen to on a summer night. So this poem starts. This is all poems that are basically fit on a page, except for the opening poem. It's kind of a prologue, set in the woods, and then the last poem is a kind of a bardo poem. So I'm going to try reading that, you know, first. One day on the Vermont border, a vetch. Stairway to nowhere with no lower steps, and there is a lot to vetch about. Mm. Various femurs and forearms and tibias of loose-skinned birches in the scattered body of ferns gone up into the hill country, the way the eye travels along 
spines of an ankle high vetch, the broken pattern of the leaves held by <coughs> an arching stem, absurd plant pokiness, car trip with dark glasses on and passing the same barn, the color of squeezed tea bags twice. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave out the euphoria of the target shooters burping reports, the bikes with fat wheels of buzz, driven by the riders of snowmobiles on dirt roads in the woods where mosquitoes saw air if you stop the open and closed garages, hoping that is not really a white pine, but a tower to bring phones back online while we mm -hmm. furiously wave our hands in front of our faces, eating the bugs more and more like ourselves by the yard. <laughs> Even so, in all that blue and green, nobody will be there to stand in the sheds by the coolers full of eggs and asparagus gathered from the meadows, especially around big rocks, dolmens nobody throws in rivers and creeks, and the coolers are empty in the sheds of these passive-aggressive types. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, this is the old, oldest poem in the book. I wrote this in 1990. Oh, I went to a Bruins game and watching the movie Dawn of the Dead with my friend Steve Allman. <laughs> and I love George Romero because George Romero is from Pittsburgh. Mm. And I'm from Pittsburgh too, so I think of him as a Pittsburgh artist, which he is. For George Romero, the poor don't shoot their zombies in their heads, not in your version. The zombies do the right things horribly. The man mourned embraces his wife. Then he bites her shoulder, and then they go ice skating, but without skates. <laughs> Jumping ahead to my second book. No. <clears throat> Mothership Prose. Where's the boss? Maybe Vermont. As for the boss under that boss, I give up fri on Fridays in July. May the cruise ship of these hours, depopulated summer, come in with white shorts and crisp white shirts and even more clavicles. I am about to step into the golden assistance of late afternoon where the bicycles with training wheels and lacrosse sticks will be out on quiet streets. Even for these, except for these tubes of fluorescent light, the moment is like the one right before I step up the stairs from one dark floor to another to bed. There are times when I fall face forward into the fast moving streams where my dirty shoes have again filled up with water, silt, and warm fish. These streams are like one of those places in the wilderness where my size 12 feet can actually be in all three mountain states at once. <laughs> hmm. There's a bit of bar in Union Square called Bull McCabe's, a little tiny bar. <clears throat> right, so this is a poem that I wrote this after going to Bull McCabe's. The adorable couple. In the bar, she shouts back, I'm a music therapist. Small bar, the musicians stand between the customers, and that's from a plunger, that trumpet mute. I work in palliative care. The magnolias are all brown shreds because they bloom too early. I am a hospice physician. What do people want to hear on your guitar? Wise men know. Only fools fall in love. The door opens, cold air, soporific, early spring, burning cold. I went to a Christian college in Bucks County in Pennsylvania. These two, their bedroom is a flute case. No, I play four sets a day, guitar, love songs, hymns for people who are dying. Pro, pro 
wrote his poem about bodegas in the Bronx. And I guess it's about belief. Baroque bodega. The ground beef empanadas are first of all saintly in a Baroque church niche carving sort of way downstairs at the bodega. Golden diapers. Got it. Potted meat in dusty cans and there is a cardboard box of fuses so don't explode. Not with a lot of syrupy looking cleaning supplies. Sponges. Beer. The kinds of coffee you really should make. Salami. The tabloids. I believe I am painted in egg white and the tree frog. Hmm. So I was going to read this poem that uh, Daisy published in um, yeah. Scoundrel Time, but I forgot <laughs> it on my desk. So here's a little prose poem called In Philadelphia. <laughs> Somewhere the glue sticks are baking, growing molten, filling tubes being sliced. The skies are full of disgusting chemical smoke. If you spend the night in the police station across the street, I don't really know that I should front you the car fare to Abington. There are not many people who work in the factory, pushing buttons to operate the enormous buckets, shears, conveyor belts, and they all have autoimmune diseases, pattern baldness, weakened teeth, the mid-Atlantic region has an upset stomach and cramps. <laughs> My sister lives in Philadelphia, and she said that a lot of people have chronic fatigue syndrome in Philadelphia. You know, so she was always talking about that. So I was like, oh, oh that guy got you. Heart of song. I think I might be a folk song when I hear one sung by an artist. An old folk singer strikes a pose. Strong looking, standing, semi bow legged, pretends to like strength. Nobody really does. The unspoken in every lyric might be baloney. <laughs> this poem I wrote for uh, my friend Katie Peterson. Our mothers died at about the same time, so we talked a lot, you know, about that. Formal feelings. After great pain, it's like daylight savings time. Sudden, squint-worthy, tired eye. If, if bugs had mammal brains, they would feel formal heading for the cracks and walls. Who put all these trees here and then soil, bulbs sending up their hard automatic mixers so I can't wait for moonlight on Bodega Red Awning? She's a Dickinson scholar. Armies of being here. Maybe a college graduate or a student, chunky clubby on hands and knees, squirts tasty bleach on the pedestals of her exercise job purgatory as if a boxer aimed his spit at the gym floor where Montgomery clift as private Robert E. Lee Pruitt with spacey, demented eyes kept plucking dandelion violets from the floors of physical health where people bring their sad bodies and cell phones and the half-employed get their euphoria and their yas yas out. I like to go to the, uh, the farmer's market, Union Square Farmer's Market. Somebody was believable. Somebody was believable olive oil at the farmer's market. So many arms with permanent tattoo schmutz on them. Part of me will always think out of tune and step. Here are like my last two poems. This is poem uh, my friend uh, Walt and I discovered like we both went to the Pennsylvania Governor School for the Arts and that's when where we kind of discovered poetry and also we grew up going to the same beach in New Jersey, Stone Harbor and Avalon, the Seven Mile Beach. So this little poem, Seven Mile Beach in October. Pulls the grape down on the bait shop, lumberjack shirt time. Before they go, colors of hay, wetland, cord grasses, burned green. 
scraggly tree of black head, loud mouth, gulls all gone, a lot of loud mouths gone, quiet egrets hang around like old ballets, bar room full of treeless uniform afternoon shine, then close your eyes on the bright beach along the waves, Dunlin shoot as black. Headless vertebrae step in Fred's tavern. The still dark and still dark smells like cocoa, booze, cola, beer. It's beautiful. It's a great burning place down there at the end of Cape May, you know. And if you go to October, it's just like you know, the Guardia Airport of shorebirds, <laughs> you know, and it's amazing like tons of monarch butterflies. So this was another poem that was, during COVID, we went down there for a week. It was great, you know, to be able to go outside and be by the beach. In Monarch World, this is the last poem. In Monarch World, at the end of the island, the monarchs grab goldenrod and headland dunes, dozens at once per stalk. Talk about rusty, even when the wind and clouds come in and blow to horsehair, and you think, how that was, while the hemisphere held in storms, in its open cloak full of yo-yos, stolen clocks, mechanical birds, and the secret smile, is that we all know this place will be snorkeled. What are you? Houses go by on the backs of trucks, the sideways silos of the septic trucks come to tap, 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 the more distant you get from the roofers at work for the rich, the lazier, the sound of the hammers, de-peopled more and more itself, the beach shows its long stripes, its blacks and tans gathering the fewer and fewer footsteps to rye, no meat in the middle of all this sun-baked neorealism of empty mm. beaches, somebody had their ducks on a leash, bills forward, straining like dogs who see <laughs> other dogs who are full of play across the fields. Who are these people? What religion do they practice? Do they play recorders and tin whistles together? Do they blare Jethro Tull? Free those ducks. We've been <clears throat> wandering in haze since medieval life, and who dosed us? The War of the Roses, two more miles of solitude, a truck parked on the sand, the fishing rods larger than any I have seen surf fishing, bolted into the sand like tent pegs, the lines way out, a dumbass can sit like a king by a cooler, he would shoot a tuna with a bazooka if he could, and the whole thing war and peace. Thank you so much. <laughs> poetry, poems, and advice, My Brother is Getting Arrested Again, and She Didn't Mean to Do It. She has been awarded Guggenheim, Hutter, and Pew Fellowships, and she's poet poetry editor for the journal Scoundrel Time, and occasionally reviews poetry for the New York Times and elsewhere. She's a member of the faculty of the Warren Wilson MFA program for writers and lives in Philadelphia. Without further ado. I'm from Philly, so I drove up today. And it's lovely to be here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I'm doing a thing where I'm actually 
not wearing my progressive lenses, but I'm wearing contact lenses and wearing reading glasses. This is an act of vanity, but then also, like, I don't know that I'm actually, it's not going to work very well, so, so I can actually read in them. <laughs> I have not forgotten. This is after Baudelaire's um, Je n'ai pas oublié. It's in memory of my husband, Jim Quinn. I have not forgotten. I have not forgotten, neighbor, our red brick row house, tiny and quiet, with the window always cracked open, even in winter, and us rolling together into the middle of the dented mattress, a rooster in someone's courtyard crowing in the gray, lording it over his harem of illegal chickens. We're like gods, we couldn't stop being naked, those evenings the sun, superbly streaming, broke its sheaf of colors on the glass seemed a giant inquisitive eye watching our long quiet suppers, its reflections spritzing like candlelight on the frugal tablecloth and on the strewn pages of your manuscripts. So um, this is a book, as, um, uh, as Adam said, of um, adaptations from Baudelaire. Um, I don't speak French very well, and I don't like Baudelaire very much. Um, so I, I feel like I should explain to you why I did this. Um, the reason, I mean, Baudelaire is a drama queen. I actually grew to love him, of course, working with him. But um, he's kind of a drama queen, and he's full of like pestilence and death, and he's kind of like gothy and full of adjectives, and um, he's more self-centered than I am. I mean, I could go on, but he's. Um, I, I also feel like his disgust is glorious. And we in America could probably use more romantic self-disgust. He's <laughs> disgust is turned at himself a lot. Um, so I started messing with Baudelaire by accident in the spring of 2020 when Jim, my husband, was dying of a cruel disease that attacked his body and mind. He spent most of his time in um, a hospital bed in the living room. And we didn't have a lot of help to speak of, so I wasn't writing a whole lot of my own poetry. I didn't have time and I didn't have the bandwidth. So. Um, I was trying to keep my hand in by just, I was just going to read two poems every day, and I was going alphabetically through my poetry library, and um, Ashbury, uh, I got to Ashbury, I was like, okay, I don't have the ability to read self-portrait and comments in her right now, so I, um, I, I pulled off some um, of his, uh, he, he translates from the French a lot, he only had one Baudelaire translation in the book, and it was um, of Paysage, which means landscape, and I read it, and I thought it was kind of lousy as a translation. And I was like, I can do better, because like, you know, I can do better than Ashbury, right? Okay, so, um, I, but I did try it, and um, I think that that's how actually translators do kind of start a lot of the time, being like, ah, I could do better than that. Um, so, um, I, I worked on it, and I worked on it very quickly, and I, this is the poem that resulted, this is the very first one I did, and it's more like a translation than most in this book, more directly a translation. Baudelaire's Paysage. To compose my sexless eclogues, I will bed down near the sky like the astrologers, and neighbor to bell towers, listen dreamily to the somber wind-carried hymns. Chin in hand, high up under the slant roof, I'll see the factories chatter and sing song, their chimneys and steeples, those masts of the city, and the giant sky dreaming of eternity. It's sweet through mists to watch a star born in the blue, lamp at the window, rivers of coal climbing the sky, moon pouring sorcery. Up there, I'll see springtime, I'll see summer, fall. And when winter comes with monotone snow, I'll close curtains and blinds and build my fairy palaces in the night. I'll dream of blue bright horizons, of gardens, of fountains crying in alabaster, of kisses, birds singing evening and morning, all that infantile idol. And when riot storms impotent at my window, I won't get up from my desk. I'll be plunged voluptuous in calling forth spring by force of will, praising sunshine from my heart, making of my burning thoughts a gentler weather. So, and when I got done with that, it seemed, there are two things. So one, first of all, it seemed like a quarantine home to me. He's in his attic, he can't go out, there's, you know, the mob is outside and he's dreaming of eternity. Um, but the best thing was, um, for the first time in a long time, I felt the pleasure of writing a poem and revising it and finishing it. That's real joy, um, as many of you, you know. And um, 
but uh, it, it came without the having to confront the blank page and having no mm -hmm. clue what to do, right? So I had these sort of structures and images to work with. So it, it was a good thing for me to be working on when I had my, my attention distracted by a lot of other things. Um, and over the next weeks and months, I tried another and another. And each poem I did seemed to have something to say about life in 2020, about illness, about losing one's beloved in a corrupt, violent, economically spiraling country led by an incompetent, malignant narcissist its police and other institutions racist, its people in crisis. So, um, that's, so that's the rest, I'm gonna read, uh, I think, like five more poems from this book. Um, this one is Daybreak. Um, helicopters sang out in the South Philly sky, and morning wind blew branches against our windows. It was the hour my dream swarm twisted me pale on my pillow. When, like a bloodshot eye, darting and twitching, the last lamp stained the day in Carnady, where, trapped in my surly body, I recast the battle between lamp and day as my struggle between intention and accident. And like a face wiped dry by breezes, the air was full of thrilling, fleeing things, <coughs> anger, change. I was tired of writing, or you were. You were tired of fucking, or I was. This and that torched boutique sent up smoke. Somebody heaved a planter into another store window. The shopkeeper put the safety back on his sidearm. With stinging eyes dialed his insurance adjuster. Someone danced on a police car. Someone blew up an ATM and his hand off with it. Women who forgot to stop bearing children mopped their brows and chewed on ice. It was the hour when sweating and starving they gave birth to their latest moaning and cursing. Like a sob cut short by foaming blood, a siren, another, tore through the fabric of mourning. Buildings snuffled like marine mammals <coughs> bedded down in a smog sea. Old ones in nursing homes, their minds gone, hawked up last juddering breaths. They'd been abandoned, as I sometimes wish to abandon you. Someone crept home, broken by stupidity. Shivery Dawn, in her green-pink shift, crawls up the Schuylkill into the parklands. Angry Philly, rubbing her eyes, grabs up her tools again. That old worker. So Baudelaire does a lot of rich, sort of um, scenic stuff like that. And he also does very spare lyrics. And I did, I'm probably more attracted temperamentally to, toward the former, but I did a bit of the um, the spare stuff, and I made it more spare in my attempt to calm him down. <laughs> Charlie, calm down. Okay. Owls. This is called Owls. In black hue shelters, owls tuck themselves away. Strange gods with red, meditating, shifty eyes. Otherwise roost unstirring till the melancholy hour when darkness shovels the sun off stage. Thus, they teach the sage she need fear in this world, only tumult and action. Passing, drunk on shadows, my punishment for desiring change is desiring more change. Okay, so I'm going to read two more poems, and the last one I'm, I've decided what to read, but you guys can decide if you want the poem that is comments on healthcare in America, or um, the poem that's like, Read all about sex and was uh, censored in Baudelaire's time. So raise your hand if you want to hear sex. <laughs> raise your hand if you want to hear healthcare in America. Oh, surprise! <laughs> okay, so the story with this one is, um, is a nice story with this one. Um, so my partner, um, I was introduced, he was from San Francisco and I was introduced, uh, the man I'm with now, uh, I was introduced to him by the poet August Kleinzahler, who thought we would get along well, and he was right. Um, so we were emailing each other back and forth for a while. And this is a good format for me because I'm a writer, so I can like really present myself well in writing. So then we like we're like, okay, we're literate, we're interested in the same things, we're nice, apparently. So now we zoom. So we zoomed and like zooming sucks, right? You know? And I was really nervous. And I'm a writer, I present myself better in writing, as I said. 
So I got off the Zoom and I was like, okay, that didn't really, I'm like really worried because I really like him and I think he really likes me, but I don't think that really went well, so I got to do something. So um, well, I decided to send him this poem. And then after I, like, you'll see why, but after I sent him the poem, he decided to get a plane ticket and visit me in Toledo. So <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but this was censored in Baudelaire's time for being, what, what is it? Um, uh, for being likely to, quote, lead to the excitement of the senses by a crude realism offensive to public decency. <laughs> um, oh, wait, very good. Never find this one. Okay. So, one of the things I did when Baudelaire looked at women writing as a man, I flipped the script and looked at men writing as a woman. So. Um, Jules. My man gets naked, and knowing my hunger, the family jewels are all he wears. This gives him an air of opulence, playing stud in the seraglio. And when he dances, virile and mocking, he seems made of a world of rock and steel. So that I may, in my beguiled fury, adore his whole body, paunch and luster. So he's lying there, letting himself be loved, and from the top of the chaise smirks with pleasure at my lust, deep and sweet as the ocean that tidal climbs a cliff. His eyes on me are a barely tame tiger's. He plays vague and dreamy, strikes poses of animal lust and ravishment, satisfying me with every twist and thrust. It's Baudelaire. I blame Baudelaire for this stuff. It's not, you know, it's not. I don't make this way. Um, and his arms and leg and his thigh and ass, polished like oil, pumping like the neck of a swan, pass before me. And now I feel becalmed. And his belly and his clusters and vine. Advance then, tempter. Disturb my soul's repose, my zen. Lure me from my crystalline calm, where I thought I might lonely rest a while. And now I swear I can see Apollo united to Priapus and hairy chest, bit of a belly, and below his narrow, dressy pelvis. The tawny textures are superb. And the lamp has resigned itself to die, and the flickering hearth barely lights the room. And every time he sighs his sigh, he swamps us both with his electricity. <laughs> sort of a creepy book, but look, it worked. <laughs> he's, he's living with me in Philadelphia. Um, so, okay, so this is, this is um, the, I think, the, one of the best poems of um, Baudelaire's, and certainly one of my favorites, is The, is the Signe, which I, as you can see, I don't pronounce it in French very well, but it means the swan. Um, and it's uh, basically a poem, among other things, about Paris changing. So I wrote, um, my version is called The Goose, and it's about Philadelphia um, in the year of the city empty in 2020. Um, I'll just mention that um, Baudelaire invokes Andromache, who is Hector's widow from the Iliad, and um, I do too. Um, in this, and, but I, the name Andromache seems to um, break down etymologically into fighter of men which was hard for me to resist, so that's why I used that phrase in the, in the poem. The Goose. Andromache, widow, fighter of men. I think of you by the poor mirror of the river which glitters with grieving, seems to show by its slow, full float the size of our sadness. It seeds my memory, walking where the road carousels. Everything bewilders, a city changes faster than a human heart. That's a field, there houses, and the grasses, green blocks where water puddled, upriver a zoo. Giraffes hung their faces over a wall. We took our girl, arriving early, the hour the air was cold and clear. There I live in memory. And here I live, Andromache, in the dull what is. Then sweaty work wakens, Traffic awakens to make of the silence a dark hurricane. And there's a goose, separated from its hateful shitting gaggle that marauds by the boathouses, rasps webs over the macadam, dodges fast cars. 
His stained hind plumage trails on the ground. He shambles near the disk of the enormous fountain, dry and silent since disease broke on us, dry since the em city emptied itself of itself, emptied its people only to rooms. Dry the bronze breasts of the river spirit statues, the bird shit stained spouting bronze <coughs> swans they hoist on their shoulders, dry maud. As if the ruins of a beloved, his broken cornices, sprawled stone blocks stained green, can be forgotten. No kids playing there, nor older folks coming back to life, coming back to ill-advised life for an early dark morning drunken grope. Nope, just the living goose, nervously bathing wings and brimming filth, scum, dung, rotten leaves. He opens his beak, heart full of his native lake he'll never return to, as if to say, water, when will you rain? Sky, when lightning, thunder. Unlucky bird, son of the sun, you stretch your pumping neck up and up toward the hazy azure, as if like me, you're blaming God who doesn't exist. Our filly changes. I wander back into glass canyons between unleasable new office towers and in the, their bases, shuttered shops with bric-a-brac displayed unbought in ghastly windows, empty bars and restaurants, their outdoor tables barely inhabited, heat lamp flames warming air where people aren't, trucks hitting wrinkle bumps, distant sirens, 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 scaffolding, rehabs paused, old mini mansions, roofs fallen in, laborers for insurance law firms, hunched at screens, working for the market, everything metaphor for memories heavier than rocks. Outside the Rodin Museum, images oppress me, dour thinker and gates of hell, and my great goose with his crazy motions, and then you, Andromache, ridiculous, sublime. Like, and not at all like, the protesters in their playing field encampment of nylon and polyester in teals and grays, pegged with cords to tired trees, with laundry hung between, and Black Lives Matter, and other signs, no cop zone, housing now, our demands. Long list. <coughs> Some sit stoned, some march about. The grass remains a stretch of emerald. I don't want to say I'm gnawed by longing for a man like a city, city like a man whose mind's a ruined city. I'm bored with these feelings they call grief. Andromache, fighter, your husband ripped from you. You felt a captive beast wandering deserted streets, heavy, aching, widow of the world. One protester emerged from the mass, tripped on a tent wire, and crying, cursed into a bullhorn, muttered something about a mama hugging, soothing them, keeping them safe. And the man I love said, you think my eyes are pretty? Oh, you should have seen my mother's eyes. They were the most beautiful blue. The last most lucid thing he said to me. Old memory like a lost goose vanishing honks out a full note. What good to think of others, forgotten, kneeled on, jailed, killed, defeated, robbed, so many others more. Thank you. <laughs>
Her second book, uh, Jornada, is forthcoming in the fall of 2022 from Trivana Barba Press. Without further ado. say a few words about uh, how this uh, unusual, maybe weird book came about and um, uh, how it happened. Uh, I still don't quite understand myself. <laughs> so it uh, started, in short, it started as a small poetry, a uh, small collection of poetry, and uh, it was my actual graduation project at MFA. I was attending at the time, it was 14 years ago. So, um, uh, but I couldn't let go. I just didn't see it as a book for a long time. Um, and then in the spring of 2020, uh, in the cold spring of 2020, I started writing prose. So um, some prose started accruing, you know, these prose fragments, and then prose kind of came together and melted back into, into what uh, into the poem. So, um, it um, became this book, and Mark Vincent, the Manhattan Press publisher, believed in this very strange book and uh, published it, for which I'm very grateful. Um, it consists of uh, four parts, and uh, if you uh, poignant, uh, readers poignantly noticed, uh, noted that it's kind of a symphony, it has a symphonic uh, structure. I'm aware of that, but it all happened, more or less, um, but I do notice it too. Uh, and the uh, first part is sort of the thorn. Um, a, a big part of the book it has to do with the Great Terror. And by the way, the Cardinal Points Journal um, that was mentioned is dedicated to de-Stalinization of the air when we started in 2005. People would be very surprised by de-Stalinization of the air. Nobody's surprised now, of course. And uh, so uh, the Great Terror is, is important for me uh, personally. Uh, because of my family and because of uh, the way I uh, uh, here, you know, grew and uh, grew up and uh, uh, feel the history. Um, but I didn't want it to be this kind of uh, very, uh, I didn't want it to be full of effect. I wanted to be as the part that has to do with the great terror, especially the part that has to do with my own people, with my own family, because the second part is called Alexander and Alexander, who are my um, great parents, uh, grandparents. It's a history of a family history, greater. But also there is just a documentary uh, um, part. Uh, I wanted to, to be uh, put in as flat voice as possible because this is how we it, as a matter of fact, as, as it was. Without much. So uh, the first part is, is called um, uh, the Thor. Because I was, I grew up in the uh, post-Stalinist thought that was born there, and uh, so the first poem. So this is pretty much before dawn. So this is uh, a little bit about an anonymity before dawn. A bird of glass, a bird with a scratched throat, a bird that tries to tell it all at once. A bird that turns its head when cold. A bird that's pinned with hopes. A bird of oh, woe. A bird that must be turned up louder. A tiptoed bird. A bird that types. A bird that strikes a match. Um, so uh, there, are, there are fragments, prose fragments, like I said, and. Um, some of them, are, I, I will just describe it being a poetry bookshop. I'd rather not read poet, poet, um, uh, uh, prose uh, fragments. It's just a short synopsis of, say, one of them. So the narrator is uh, skiing, cross country skiing with her father uh, uh, in the suburbs of Moscow. And then later it turns out that it was the uh, place of the uh, massacre in, during the late 30s. And uh, so there's some. Um, there's, uh, I read things, uh, archives and things, and so collected um, data from different places. So um, it's there. 
uh, but also um, a part of this little piece is um, it, it's important today and yesterday uh, because uh, literally because um, uh, I, this girl me is uh, sitting with the thawing ski shoes too tired to take them off and reading the profundus and not really understanding from the cryptic Soviet preface what actually happened to that man <laughs> why did what was he jailed and why is why, why and, and she and she is crying because it's just heartbreaking without actually understanding the reason I'm saying today and yesterday because these days there is a um, project of a law which probably will become a law in Russia in the Russian Federation probably in December uh, banning all homosexual um, activity at all not even propaganda that used to be uh, as it was this year and the year before so it's all <laughs> really uh, becoming very real um, but uh, so speaking of that place uh, of course when you come here the people ask you why 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 did you leave why how can someone leave the place where people speak the language that's so important to you so this is an attempt to explain uh, and the, the image there is that, you know, in villages sometimes, and probably in America too, uh, th th there is this uh, card that comes with a projector, film projector in you know, olden days. And they, and they show the film on that screen, which is sometimes a sheet, just a, you know, red sheet. So this happens in some uh, pioneer, some camp. Um, at dawn, someone hangs a sky like a worn out, wrinkled screen on the village's far end. The old projector rolls in from the east on its heavy cart. And I walk through the tall grass of Russian syllables, where colons and commas are abundant in June, and syntax is vague on ladybugs' wings. I would settle nowhere else. Wouldn't settle for less. Trust me, nothing would ever suffice. But how do I explain how I dread the expression on my motherland's face? Um, uh, now, um, this is, uh, th there is a cycle, uh, in this uh, forthcoming book, Jornata, the cycle is in full, it's called In Absentia. It's a cycle of um, mm, losing, and ha having lost, rather, and then living in the same house, in absentia. Uh, so this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, poems. Um, it's called In Absentia at Twilight. Today I am Mrs., not Mr. Nabokov, standing here in the yard in my red faded boots and my stepson's oversized plaid shirt. I assemble the leaf blow myself and I stand breaking apart last year's matted foliage, watching indifferently as the weighty top rotted layer lifts and I steer this heavy tsunami one after the other into the ravine by the shed. It's the time when dreams fill with my dead mountains block what's left of the sun. They darken toward evening, first one, then the second, the third. They linger, turning mauve and move off to the west like leaves to the ravine. By the way, it's all happening in the northeastern um, Pennsylvania Falkners. Um, and, let me see. Mm -hmm. Still have some time. Um, so uh, living, living in the, so then the immigration, the third part is, uh, so the second part is this family story, Alexandra and Alexandra, although there is Zabalotsky and Shostakovich and other, um, other <coughs> slivers of, of the time. And um, the third one is most important poetry, and it's sort of kind of um, adagio in a way. Um, and so one of the poems, and, and a lot of it has to do with the already cr having crossed this border, 
and they, they make the most important border for many of us, and uh, they uh, emigrate people. And um, we, we, I prefer to say emigrate rather than immigrants, mm. immigrants because for us it's much more important uh, living than wherever, you know, it doesn't matter where. <laughs> Which is, as we see now, right, uh, in all directions. So even when uh, we were living um, right after the coup in 1991, it was about what you're leaving behind rather than where you're coming. Um, ready to become anonymous in the absolutely um, without any aspirations of any, any kind of. Um, and then you find yourself in this between two languages uh, more and more increasingly. And um, I, I, I think I agree with the idea, it's not my idea, that not languages, that we, not that we speak languages, but languages speak us. I agree with this idea wholeheartedly. So um, this is um, between a willow and a birch tree, one language is associated with the birch tree and another one with a willow. You easily guess which one between the Russian and the English one. And this is for Charlie Newton. November wind sways you bewildered, lost between two languages, one a birch tree and one a willow. And you, betrothed to one, betray the other. Stand barren, bitter, on the vast plain between two trunks, each outside your reach, not daring to touch the bark where blood drums under in consonants, in vowels, in veils of anvil clouds, long, wet, and heavy trench coats covered in icy crust. You stand between your people and people not yours, between man and woman, not knowing who you are, where will be, birch or willow, bewitched to the weeping endings of one and of the other, translucent past tenses, so effortlessly peeling off. Uh, so, you understand which one is called, right? Past tenses. Uh, I only, I'm wrongly reading the poems that were either written in English directly, as this one, for example, and the attempt to explain, uh, or rewritten by myself, but there, uh, but there, uh, quite a few poems translated by remarkable translators: Angela Livingstone, the Chitaiva, amazing Chitaiva, uh, British Chitaiva translator, um, Tony Brinkley, and very importantly for me, my very dear friends, uh, the uh, remarkable translators, uh, Boris Drelyuk and Maria Blostein. Um, the journal of the book that was mentioned is solely poems in translation by Boris and by Maria. Um, so um, I will read just one more poem, which is um, uh, it, it's it's a, a free version of a um, also sort of anonymous uh, poem. It's anonymous because it was translated from the language of Dagestan Avar, uh, written by this famous. Uh, of our uh, Dagestan poet, Soviet poem, pretty much a designated Dagestan poem, you know, that in the Soviet Union there were designated poets for each region. So he was uh, one for the Dagestan. But this is it's an amazing poem. Uh, I only read it in Russian, of course, by, uh, translated by a very good Russian translator, now Kremlin. And uh, I trans sort of, uh, I wrote a variation based on this Russian translation. It became a very um, popular, in, in, <laughs> remarkably, uh, popular song um, associated with the war, with soldiers, absolutely already loyal. Any ethnicity, any kind of identity, or any, uh, no ethnographic kind of aspect to this, just uh, epic allergy, universal. And I am designating, I am dedicating it today to the fallen soldiers. A song from Dagestan. Sometimes I think 
that soldiers who have never come back to us from the blood-covered plains escaped the ground and didn't cross the river, but turned instead into white screeching cranes. And since that time, the flock is flying narrow or wide or long, and maybe that is why so often and with such a sudden sorrow, we stop abruptly staring at the sky. On flies the wedge, trespassing every border, a sad formation, ranks of do re mi, and there is a gap in their open order. It is the space that they have reserved for me. The day will come beneath an evening cloud. I'll fly, crane on my right, crane on my left, and in a voice like theirs, <coughs> shrill and loud, call out, call out to those on earth. Thank you very much. Let's give the poets who read tonight another round of applause. Thanks for coming, everybody. We have some books for sale. The poets will be signing books. If you could all please move your chairs up against the wall, I'd be grateful. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Steph. Yeah. We have a reading on the creates about two weeks from now. What are those reports? I'll send you a little email. I know you're working for me, so it's going to be a little bit if you want to do it. Tell me, <laughs> tell me the reading. We were hoping to move the reading on the seventh thing. We weren't working with me. Oh yeah, that was the best. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened yet. Okay, we were really hoping for that because Laura's out of the way. But yeah, if you tell me who is, if you tell me who, who you have, who is, who, 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 yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, to get a message again. Oh, not really. We just got a call from Cooper, so we just turned around. We're about to hide out. I got a little bit of time. I had more time so when I was in the process. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to work on the Foundation. Yeah. Right. I know. 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 Um, I might have a Harvard books right now, but I might come back to help you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you? Um, yeah, I was going to say, I'm just going to give a run. Oh, okay.